Well, good morning, everybody. How are you? It's a, uh, it's a great time to be a Christian. It's, uh, it, it might be a challenging time as well going forward, but notwithstanding, it's a great time to be a Christian. <clears throat> I don't know if you've heard, but there are some things going on out there. If you've been living under a rock, you might not have known, but, uh, but otherwise you would be aware. Um, of course, the Asbury Revival, as, uh, as it came to be known, has been officially closed by the leadership at Asbury. Um, I, think, I think their intentions were good. I, I'm not here to take shots at them for that. Uh, but anyway, that, that thing has been moved now to a different location in central Kentucky. Presumably it will still go on, but I guess we'll see how that goes. But you know, there's been a lot more going on than Asbury. Uh, if you have been paying attention, there's been something in Dawsonville, Georgia, known as the Baptismal Revival. And it's been going on for the last four years and a bit. And um, the thing that is unique about it is that many people are coming and being baptized. You guys are having a baptismal service coming up. Well, many people have come from all over the world to be baptized there, except they're trying to talk about it more in the language of um, the Jewish community. So they're saying, this is really your opportunity to dip into a mikveh. And that way they don't run afoul of those who believe that, you know, baptism is only once in a lifetime and after that it's, it's out of bounds. Around here you guys probably wouldn't say too much about that. But I will tell you, uh, centuries ago during the Reformation, uh, people who wanted to be baptized, as they said, again, because they'd been baptized as babies and they now had a living faith of their own. If they wanted to give expression to that through baptism, that was a capital offense in Catholic and Protestant lands. So the idea of being rebaptized, there is still some taint on that in a lot of circles of the church. So the guys in Dawsonville have uh, wisely, in my opinion, positioned this as a mikveh, which the Jews dip multiple times a day. And so that way you can get around that, that hurdle. But anyway, so we've got Asbury, we've got the baptismal revival, and another one you may or may not have heard of is Lou Engel. Uh, just prior to Benny Johnson's death, so that's now been, she died in July, so that's been uh, about seven months or so, maybe eight, because we're just about in March. Um, he went there and he asked her to lay hands on him and pray for him. Uh, because she had published a book on the power of communion and he wanted to start a communion revival. And so he's been going around holding these rallies and large numbers of people are gathering to take communion publicly. And so we've got the Asbury revival, we've got the baptismal revival, we've got the communion revival, and the embers have spread a bit and there's now at least 20 college campuses where... Uh, they're having their own version of Asbury. It hasn't made the news as much, but if you're paying attention and you know you're paying it, you know kind of who's who's speaking into all of this, uh, you would you would be aware of that. Well, we could ask the question, what in the heck is going on? And uh, the answer is, it seems like God is really starting to move this time. In the charismatic world, we've been expecting a great end-time revival <clears throat> since 1988. And we can actually put a line in the sand on that one, and so that's 35 years ago. 1988 is important because it's the year that Paul Cain came out of obscurity. Uh, he had been part of the latter rain outpouring, which, depending on whose history you follow, it came to an end either in the late 50s or the early 60s. But he'd been basically hiding out in Phoenix, Arizona for about 25 years, and he'd been not doing much except praying. Every now and then he'd venture out and preach an event or something, but he mostly was not active. But he, uh, he found his way to Kansas City, and he began preaching about Joel's army. Now, everybody got really fired up, and Mike, you would remember when Paul showed up preaching on Joel's army. Some wouldn't, but I know you were around. So... Um, this was, this was part of the landscape, and everybody was like, yeah, Joel's army. And so the way Paul preached this, Joel's army was going to be a group of people who were equipped with signs and wonders, and they were going to encompass the earth, and they were going to go out and 
uh, there would be many amazing things that would happen as a result of the activity of Joel's army. It was, it was a powerful idea. It certainly energized an entire generation of Christians. And I would say, you don't hear much about it today, but I think the, the momentum that it generated is still going on. There was one small problem with it, and that is that exegetically it didn't really work with the way the book of Joel is written, uh, which, so that was kind of humorous. But nevertheless, it, it, it got traction and it got wings under it. But at the same time Paul Cain was talking about the billion, excuse me, the Joel's army, Bob Jones was talking about the billion soul harvest. And of course everybody knows about that one because that language is still being used, the expectation that a billion people will come to faith and uh, when they do, um, they will be, as Bob called them, fish cleaners. And there's no, uh, there's no correlation here between the fact that my last name is Fish and Bob was <laughs> talking about fish cleaners. That is just a circumstance and an artifact of history. But um, anyway, so he said that this billion soul harvest, these people would be the ones who would actually prepare for the greater harvest. And I think sometimes people lose sight of that kind of second wave, but the second wave was supposed to be three billion more. So we got the first billion plus three billion, that's four billion. And it's an interesting data point that in November of 2022, so four months ago, the population of this planet crossed eight billion people. So what, if this word holds, and I mean, Bob had a pretty good record, so um, if this word holds, that would mean half the earth um, is somehow getting positioned and lined up to come to faith. Well, the other thing that's of interest is Bob prophesied that when the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl, it would be a sign that the Lord was raising up his chiefs. It was a word play. It was a prophetic parable or riddle. Um, and the, the chiefs were to be these apostolic leaders who would uh, lead this end time harvest of now four billion if you count them all. Well, in 2020, the chiefs won the Super Bowl after a Another interesting number, 50-year hiatus. They hadn't won the Super Bowl since 1970. Um, but as I recall it, Bob prophesied two wins of the Chiefs, and he said the first one would be kind of like, well, it's like when a batter gets up on deck, but he's not yet at, at, you know, at the plate ready to bat. And there would be a second one that would come behind it, and it would change that uh, release from imminent to now. And so, uh, as you all know, because it's been all over social media, and many of you actually watch football, uh, you would all know that the Chiefs won the Super Bowl again this year, three years after they won it after a 50-year drought. Well, I checked with Mike Bickle about this because I wanted to be sure. He didn't actually recall the prophecy of two wins, um, so we'll leave that specific point open. But, I, but when Mike and I talked about Ukraine, when all that started up, I said, I remember Bob saying that World War III would begin in just north of the Black Sea, which is exactly where Ukraine is located. Um, and then when I said that, he was like, oh, yeah, you are right about that. So maybe I'll be right on this one, too. We'll see. But anyway. All right, so we've got, we've got these prophecies that have framed a generation, we've, the Joel's army or billion soul harvest. They're essentially prophesying into the same sort of dynamic. They're just using very different language because we have two very different prophets that were uh, bringing those words. And um, as we think of all that, and we look at the times in which we're living, it, it could actually be that we may be on the verge of the big one. It might actually be right this time. There have been a lot of other revivals that have come and gone in the midst of all this. Of course, Toronto comes to mind. And we would be remiss if we omitted the Vineyard Revival itself, uh, which preceded the, re the Toronto Revival. And then, of course, there's been Brownsville, and there's been um, Lakeland, and there's been some other regionalized outpourings. But what's interesting is this one seems to be spreading um, without any particular centralized government over it. And that's probably a good thing. And at the last number that I saw, uh, there were probably 20 campuses that have something like Asbury going on. And this is continuing to propagate. There are churches that are sort of breaking into this revival-type 
singing, and I, I noticed the worship this morning was amazing, but I always think the worship here is amazing. You have this, this house just, yeah. Well, anyway, that's all, um, that's all backdrop and preamble to what I want to talk about this morning, which is why uh, this time it's different. So I, I said a moment ago, we may actually be on the, on the leading edge of the big one this time. And um, we'll see. Time will, time will tell, but um, all signs are indicating that we have, uh, as they say at, at Cape Kennedy, we have ignition. And now we're ready for the launch. So I want to talk a little bit about why it's different this time. <clears throat> okay, here we go. <clears throat> Luke chapter 1, verse 3, reads this way, In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, Tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis. Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God. Okay, I don't know if I'm going to get through this. My mother always used to say she hated pre preachers who cry, and I have no reason to be crying except the Lord's on me. But it makes it hard to talk, and it's really embarrassing to cry in front of 400 people. <laughs> The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? Well, we could go on with reading this, but we will start with that. Well, I started out this morning talking about Asbury and the baptismal revival in Dawsonville, Georgia, and this moving revival that Lou Engel is leading centered around communion. And I said there have been other hot spots that have erupted. And of course, um, it was on Wednesday that the movie The Jesus Revolution was released. And I don't know where he's sitting, but Stan Frisbee's in the house. And he's, he's the, there he is right there. He's the brother of, uh, of the now deceased Lonnie Frisbee. Yeah. Lonnie died in 1993, so we're 30 years on from that. And again, another interesting year, another, just one of those divine sort of plays on numbers. But you know, many times in life people say things are different, but they actually are not. Um, they're the same as they've always been in the early 1990s, if you can remember back that far, around the time that Lonnie went home to the Lord, uh, we had a savings and loan crisis in this country. And, you know, they cleaned it up and they said, it'll never happen again. Well, it did. <laughs> and so uh, it really wasn't different. In the year 2000, we had the internet bubble burst, and if anyone remembers that, the stock market cratered, and we had zero revenue companies going public with billion-dollar valuations. And people said, well, this is, this is possible because this time it's different. But it wasn't different. And the reason the stock market cratered was suddenly people woke up and said, hang on, you can't take a company public with no revenue and give it a billion-dollar valuation. And so that was the end of that. 
And then in 2007, we had what was known as the global financial crisis. And I'm using business things that are easily identified in the press on purpose. Um, this was caused by mortgages that were written to people with no income and then credit swaps that, that backed all of the banking system to allow banks to trade away these mortgages that had no value and eventually people realize these mortgages have no value because people aren't paying on them and so the entire real estate market cratered. Nothing was different. But we're living in a time when a move of God and awakening, if you want to call it that, is stirring and this time it will be different. It's going to be different. And I already said, I think we may well be on the leading edge of the big one. I'm watching for this thing to unfold, but um, there's a lot of reasons I think that it needs to be now, and it has little to do with the need of the earth, and it has everything to do with the wider prophetic time clock, which the Lord has laid out uh, within his word. There's no time to go into all that this morning. But I just want to try and um, define from this passage and the ministry of John the Baptist what might be different about this move of God that we are standing on the leading edge of? This story um, out of Luke 3, it's, a, it's an extraordinary story, really, partially because it's rooted in history. If you were paying attention, as I read through the first few verses, it's describing the rulers, the leaders of the various pieces of the Holy Land um, in the time when John appeared, and it also gives us a specific year. It says it was the 15th year of Tiberius. Well, Tiberius was the Caesar who followed Augustus. And as you remember, Augustus had given a decree to tax the whole world. And that's how it happened that Joseph and Mary were in uh, Bethlehem at the time of Mary's delivery of Jesus. Um, and so Tiberius is the one who succeeds him. And we know just doing the math, this would make it the year 29 AD. So it's... There's, there's a whole analysis behind that. It's not that hard, but it's too much for a Sunday morning sermon. And it tells us, okay, in the year 29 AD, we know Pontius Pilate's name. He's the, he's the governor. He's the guy who rules all of Judea, but the Romans broke things up into fours. That was their process. And so a tetrarch, tetra is the word for four, and arch is a ruler. So these are rulers of a quarter. And so it tells us who the others were. We've got Herod. This isn't Herod the Great. This is his brother. Uh, excuse me, his son. Um, so we've got Herod, and then we've got Herod's brother, Philip, and we've got Lysanias. And we know that Annas and Caiaphas are somehow have a power-sharing agreement in the temple. Um, and it's, John is, Luke is saying in this that, that there is some sort of cahoots going on between the religious leaders and the political leaders as well. So it's rooted in history. It's not merely spiritual feelings. It's bedrock reality. And God wants our faith tied to reality. That's one of the first lessons we can learn about what's different about this time. A lot of, a lot of things have come and gone in the, in the history of spirituality where it's all about you know, sentimental feelings. In fact, there was an entire movement that came out of Germany called the Pietist Movement a couple of hundred years ago. And it was all about feelings. And they, it was as though the history didn't matter. But Luke is trying to tell us in this that history does matter, and so the things that can be nailed down, tied down, that matters to us in terms of how we think about the move of God. And so with that, we can say that the dichotomy that has been thrown at us for years about um, faith versus reason is going to be answered, and our faith is about to become much more evidential. And with that, there's going to be an increase in miracles and signs and wonders and healings, but there will also be prophetic words that are given and they will have prominence and they will come to pass. You might remember that there was many words that were out there about the coming of the Messiah in the time of Jesus. And people were wondering as they looked at John, it says they were in expectation and they wondered, could this be the Christ? They knew something was coming. That wasn't in doubt. The problem was they didn't know when it was going to come and they weren't sure who it was. And John was the first voice they'd heard like this in 400 years. So it was easy to step back and say, well, then this has to be the guy. And John says, I'm actually not the guy. There's one coming after me and he's more powerful than I am. He's more anointed than I am. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And I'm baptizing you with water, but he will baptize you with fire. And so with that, what else we can see is that 
This move of God, if you want to say it this way, the billion soul harvest is a John the Baptist revival preparing the way for the Jesus revival. And that means there's a generation of Johns rising. And I think it's safe to say all of the people in this house are probably on deck to be part of all of that. So the faith is becoming more evidential. And we've been actually seeing this for a while. The Signs and Wonders movement, which John Wimber uh, birthed himself, there were others that were doing it, but nobody did it like John. That has continued on. John's been gone. This is the 26th year since he, uh, since he left us. It, well, it'll be the 26th anniversary in November, so we're in year 25, if you want to say it that way. But anyhow, I just did that for the benefit of the many who would nail me down and say, wait, you were off by a year. Um, but anyway, the Signs and Wonders movement itself is part of the preamble leading up to this thing. And so, um, you know, the prophetic was the leading edge of that. And typically in these kinds of moves, we see it with John the Baptist, the Lord brought a prophet before he brought Jesus. And so the Signs and Wonders movement had its own beginning, but alongside of it came the Kansas City prophets and everything that they represented. And along the way, our faith has become more evidential. There are more documentable, documentable healings and miracles and other things that are truly miraculous that aren't even of a medical nature that are going on around the world than have, there have ever been. And if you take the time to research this, you will easily find that the numbers are multiplying and they're actually multiplying exponentially. It's literally going on everywhere. I, by the way, I, this is, I didn't intend to say this, but it just popped into my mind. I have a book coming out uh, called On the Road with the Holy Spirit, A Modern Day Diary of Signs and Wonders. It'll be published in June. Uh, you can pre-order it now if you want to on Amazon. But, but anyway, that book is coming out, and I will tell you, the, uh, the, the publishing house said to me, we haven't had anybody write a book like this in, well, since Maria Woodworth Eder. Wow. And in the fact that you have this much documentary evidence, and you know all the stuff in there has been certified and verified, um, they said, that this is incredible. This tells us that something really big is happening. Well, I happen to be the one who wrote the book, but I really, I really attribute, and I credited this in the book, I attribute all of it to what I learned from John and a few others who were sidekicks of his that I was fortunate enough to know. Well, so we've got this evidentiary faith, and we have an uptick in this supernatural dimension. Um, the second thing we can say, and it comes again out of this passage, <clears throat> John goes into the region around the Jordan, and he's proclaiming baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and he's, he's talking about this ju divine juxtaposition. On the one hand, we've got the most powerful empire the world has ever known, and it's led by a man named Tiberius. By the way, in modern Israel today, on the Sea of Galilee, there is a town called Tiberius. Do you know where the name came from? That town was built by Tiberius in his own honor, and it's existed for a couple of millennia, and there it is to this very day. And so even as there is a man with that much hubris uh, in power, another king emerges, and this one is Jesus. And so we have a juxtaposition of the kingdom of heaven against the kingdoms of the earth. It's the old order versus the new order. It's the kingdoms of men versus the kingdom of God. Tiberius would have had his own herald running ahead of him saying, Hail Caesar, and all men and women would have been required, compelled to bow before him. Jesus had a herald too. His name was John the Baptist, and he said, Prepare the way of the Lord. And so one of the things that's going to start happening is there's going to be some sort of a heartthrob or a cry, a surging... I know it's going to come on social media. It's going to come through our mouths. But we're going to be telling people, You better get ready. You better prepare the way of the Lord because it, it, Jesus is coming. Now, we had our own version of this in the Calvary movement back, you know, back in the day, but this one is different. And so, as this message, prepare the way of the Lord, get ready, prepare your hearts, prepare your lives, as this was going out, people in their spiritual hunger, they voluntarily left uh, their cities. They emptied the cities of Judah and all of the regions around in order to come out to the Jordan River and be baptized. This would have disrupted commerce a little bit, just a little bit. I'm being very facetious. 
They were looking to find freedom of life in the Lord. They were looking to escape the oppression of a political order run amok. Now, I could go a long way with that, but I'll just stop there because that's not my focus this morning. But Tiberius's herald would have come from the city, from the seats of power, of learning, of prestige, and of influence. We could add to that, maybe in our time, media centers, places like New York, Washington, whatever. But Jesus' herald came from the most unlikely place. He came from the wilderness. And we know from history that John, he was born to aged parents who had never been able to have a child, and it says that he lived in the wilderness until the time of his appearing. There's a lot of evidence, and I personally believe it's right, so I'm going to speak it as though it, it is correct. You can't, you can't tie it down to a chapter and a verse, but it's, it's quite likely that John the Baptist lived among the Essene community on the northwest corner of the Dead Sea, and he would have been involved in all that the Essenes were doing. And when he began baptizing, the place where he began baptizing is not Yardanit, if you've ever been to modern Israel. It is down near the mouth of the Dead Sea, about a quarter mile, 400 yards north of there. And they know this is the site. There's still damage to the, the desert from all the feet of people treading down the plants and flattening the earth and so forth. And so that is the baptismal site. You could have walked from Qumran to there in not more than two hours. And so when John began baptizing, he picked a place where there was water, and it was nearby to where he'd been living in the wilderness. But the point is, <clears throat> Tiberius would have had a herald, somebody announcing his power, and Jesus had a herald, somebody announcing his, but Jesus picked something out of the way. He picked something unlikely. And it's often the case that moves of God arise in out-of-the-way places, like, like Wilmore, Kentucky. Who's ever heard of Wilmore, Kentucky? unless they know about Asbury University and Seminary. The vineyard came out of, well, West L.A. originally, but, but Ken Gullickson handed it over to John Wimber very early, and then it became located in Yorba Linda. And I can remember as a boy, my mother had some friends who left West Los Angeles. They had two blind sons, and they moved out to Yorba Linda. And I can remember my mother saying, Yorba Linda? Where's your Belinda? Who moves to your Belinda? But this was, this was you know, another era. It was the 60s and 70s, and Orange County wasn't as developed. And so your Belinda was itself kind of on the edge of beyond. And by the way, so was Costa Mesa, where Calvary Chapel got started. So God has a penchant for starting things in strange, out-of-the-way places. Maybe Laguna Niguel will be one. Why not, Mike? Have a go, right? But think about Bethel. You know, who goes to Reading? Reading's a long way from anywhere, even today. Now and then you can catch a flight into Reading, but good luck renting a car because they don't have car rental there. And so you still got to figure out how you're going to get around. Otherwise, you fly into Sacramento and you drive a couple of hours. So, you know, Reading is another out of the way place. And we could go down and name other movements. Kansas City, I mean, they do have a major league football team but, uh, and, and a baseball team. But most people in most parts of the country, Kansas City is not front and center of their mind. I'm not trying to insult our friends at IHOP. I'm simply saying it is a bit off the beaten path. And when we think about other moves of God and other outpourings, this is often the way it comes. So when the voice arises, it often comes from unexpected places, far from the mainstream. And in this case, it came from Judea, an undesirable backwater post for an ambitious Roman proconsul on his way up. And the voice of the Lord came from the wilderness of Judea, from the back of beyond. And when it came, it upset the schemes of men. And this is why these verses accompany the coming of John the Baptist. Because, you know, if you are going to have every valley be lifted up, if you are going to have every mountain and hill laid low, and if all of the rough places are going to become smooth, you are not going to do this with a shovel. You're going to do this with a fleet of bulldozers. And it would be a great time to be buying, not literally, but to be buying stock in companies like Caterpillar and Komatsu and John Deere. 
we're talking about something that is intensely disruptive. In Silicon Valley, they love the language of disruptive change. Stand by. The mountains are going to fall and the valleys are going to get filled in with the dirt. And so that means there is going to be an entire change in all kinds of things. And people are going to wonder what on earth is going on. And so when the voice of the Lord came, it began to upset the schemes of men. Certainly Herod's appointed puppets were upset and disturbed. And of course, he made inquiry and ultimately sought to kill Jesus because of an angelic warning. Joseph flees to Egypt, but many baby boys died because of that. There, there was a lot of upheaval in the first coming. And you know, as I think about this, I, 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 <laughs> I've been thinking about I've been thinking about verse 2 of this passage for many, many years, and I've, I've looked at this thing over and over again in Greek. There's a very unique construction in this second verse when it says that the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. The construction, I won't bore you with you know, Greek grammar and all that, but the, the construction is a very unusual one. You don't find it very often. And it means that the word of God came expressly upon John. It had, a, it had a defined purpose. It wasn't merely that he got anointed, but it was a summoning and it was a calling unto something. And the way the Greek works, it means that there was an initial deposit, but then it began to duplicate and then reduplicate and reduplicate and reduplicate until it grew and grew and grew in force until it couldn't be held back any longer. I remember um, reading an article some years ago, and I, J.C. Holborn sitting down here in the front row, uh, call out to him. He's worked for JPL and NASA in the past. And um, I remember reading this article about Pioneer 11. It was launched in 1973. And it took um, six and a half years to reach Saturn, but it finally got there. And uh, they were writing an article about Pioneer 11 and the signals that were coming back off the transmitter that was on board that spacecraft. Now remember, six and a half years of traveling through space. And so how does that work? Well, they sure weren't using solar panels. There's a small nuclear reactor on board, and that's generating everything they need. And so it flies by Saturn, and it's taking measurements and all this stuff. And the article began, it came in as a whisper, a mere billionth of a watt. And then it said that the um, Earth stations in the Anacapa Desert, in Southern California, in the Mojave Desert, and in Australia, there were Earth stations that were connected to capture that signal. Essentially, the entire Earth had become a listening station for that billionth of a watt, but they captured it because of the size of the dish, effectively, that they had created. And then they put it into repeaters, computers that upgraded the signal, and then it went from a billionth to two billionths to four to eight to 16, and on it went. And pretty soon it was strong enough. But, you know, this is really, it's almost a metaphor for us. The whole Earth is listening. The whole Earth is listening for a word from God. Paul talks about this. The Earth is groaning for the sons of God to be revealed. And, you know, we really do need this billion soul harvest. We really do need a Joel's army. We really do need a John the Baptist revival because the earth is in agony waiting for something. And all their ears are tuned for that billionth of a watt signal. And do you know who's going to be the one who picks it up and amplifies it? It's going to be the people of God. And so, anyway, the Pioneer 11 thing to me is somehow, uh, somehow prophetic. Well, so John comes, and he is himself a sign. Why? Because he shouldn't have been born. His mother had been barren for years, and it was only because an angel had appeared and said, you will have a son, you will name him John, that, that in the end he is born. And there's been a long silence of a good and proper word from God, 400 years. Well, thankfully, we haven't been in you know, quite as long of a drought. But at times you might wonder, is all of what is being promulgated the word of the Lord. And so we need something to clarify and make known to the people of God and the people of the earth what is really the word of the Lord. And that's going to become very clear. When God's word, God's voice, God's calling 
come to the fore. This often follows a period of hardship. Mike was talking about the things that are increasing and blessing that's coming now that COVID seems to be in the rearview mirror. Fingers crossed they don't come up with a new variant. I mean, discover a new one. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes it just comes out of my mouth. I can't help it. <clears throat> but you know, um, God's not in a hurry. And one of the things we learn is that the worse it gets, the better it gets. The, the more difficulty we encounter, the more likely it is God will move. So the children of Israel, they cried out in their affliction, and the Lord came down and rescued them out of Egypt. And in the time of the Romans, the people were crying out. They were groaning under the affliction of Rome, and the Lord sent his own son to come and rescue them. And so when God's word comes, it's always obvious, but it started with this billionth of a watt signal that landed on John. And I think part of why he was in the desert for all those years is that was his time of reduplication. He didn't have computerized enhanced processing to upgrade the signal. And so as he prayed and waited on the Lord in the community of the Essenes, that was where he really came into the understanding of what was happening and what was now. It's interesting as well that the Essenes had among them a prophetic tradition that Pliny the Elder documents and so um, maybe he was learning something of what it meant to be prophetic among these very few that carried the word of the Lord in this way. But when there is a release, when the detonation point comes, you can pinpoint it. Uh, Luke does it in this passage. He says it happened in the 15th year of Tiberius, and Tiberius came to power in the year 14 AD. Well, we can document when Asbury started. It was on the 8th of February, 2023. If you want to go back and document when Dawsonville started, they know when it started. I didn't bother to check that one this morning, but, but it's easy to find. So all of these things, they start to have a kind of um, chronographic certainty to them. The next thing we can say about the coming move of the Lord is that it's not arising from the halls of political or ecclesiastical power, but it is absolutely going to affect them. When we start talking about tearing down mountains and raising valleys, um, all, everything's going to be affected by this. All flesh will see the glory of the Lord. All flesh. Everybody. So it's interesting, you know, Luke has laid out all of these political hot shots that are living there in the Levant, and he has also described, in a roundabout way, the compromise of the religious uh, system. So the move of God is beyond the control of entrenched powers. It's arising far from the centers of power and influence and prestige, as we've seen, but it's welling up among the people as a sovereign move of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to grow. And so this is a great time, as I said when I stood up here, it's a great time to be a Christian. Now there's a couple of Hebrew words that we want to grab onto here. The first one is davar, and it means the word, and the other is the kol, which is the voice. The, vo the word and the voice are not exactly the same. Sometimes we think of them as the same, and people kind of blend them together. But words, words create sentences, create paragraphs, create chapters. But the question is, what's the voicing? Uh, J.C. not only worked at JPL, he's also a cello player. And a cello has a particular voice to it. If you are a bass player or you like bass guitars, people talk about the voicing of the bass much more than they do so about regular guitars. And so that voice kind of gives you a sense of the intonation. Is it stern or is it lighthearted and sweet? And so that voicing overlays the words, and with that the message comes. And, and as the word begins emerging, it says the word of God came expressly upon John in the desert. As the word becomes a message, the message actually takes on a voice, and the voice becomes the cry in the wilderness. And so watch for a cry coming from wilderness-type places and that will actually begin impinging on the major cities. What I'm saying is don't look for the revival to come out of Hollywood. Don't look as much as I'm happy about the Fris Frisbee movie. Uh, don't look for the uh, cry to come out of New York City or Washington or Boston or Atlanta. Look for it to come from other places, which you are, in fact, already seeing. Dawsonville, Georgia is 90 miles out of Atlanta, and Lou Engel's moving all around doing things in strange, out-of-the-way places. And, of course, Asbury, we've already noted, is a small uh, town in Kentucky. 
And so it's, there's no coincidence in the fact that um, prophecy is part of all of this because prophecy is typically the leading edge of great moves of God. I could take you through many places in the Bible to show this, but this one alone is enough. First we have John the Baptist, the voice, and then we have uh, that crying in the wilderness, and that crying in the wilderness summons people out of all the corruption in the cities. Now I've seen this happen in various places in my journeys and travels um, where there will be something that happens prophetically that maybe the passage I'm speaking from is given by somebody in a prophetic word over the room. And of course that gives me great confidence that I'm actually on track that night. Other times I've seen it where um, there will be confirmation. I remember one time I was preaching in Australia about mm, six or seven years ago, and I said, God is about to release a word in Australia, and it's going to, it's going to come from the East Coast, and it's going to ricochet off the West Coast, and it's going to come back. But it's going to start in a small place. Well, it, as it happened, as soon as I uttered those words, there was a thunderous clap. And it was so loud, the building shook. And several people you know, hit the floor in fear. And just about that time, not exactly at that time, but just moments later, as it turned out, a meteor entered the atmosphere and struck the ground near where I was speaking. Well, like I said, evidential signs. And so um, as we think about this second thing, this second point, that God is going to move in areas that, that we might have otherwise overlooked. And it may well be that this thing fans out as people are sent to areas like that to carry the word. That's what the early apostles did. They went to the wild lands in the east. They went to places like the mountains of Persia. And they went into what today we call Armenia and um, Azerbaijan and Georgia these were, I mean, certainly the Romans knew about them and they controlled those areas militarily, but, but these were not really the main thing in the Roman Empire. Rome was the main thing in the Roman Empire, and so was Constantinople once it got built and so forth. But those areas became the strongholds of Christendom for a thousand years and more afterward. And so we might look for some new centers of power to come out of this in terms of the, the center of gravity of the church. Well, the third thing we can learn from this story that we've read in Luke um, is that just as history matters, so does the life we need, and now it becomes very personal. So John's message was a summons to change, and it said, you know, the, people are, the crowds are coming out to him. He obviously did not learn how to win friends and influence people because as the crowds are coming to him, he says, you brood of vipers. Well, even in ancient Israel, everybody knew that wasn't a favorable thing. <laughs> but what he's really saying is your lives are like a ball of snakes, poisonous ones at that. And you know, the funny thing about baby snakes, brood means a, a young, not, not grown snakes. The funny thing about baby snakes, and, and this is any herpetologist in the room would know this, um, they, they gather together in balls to retain some form of heat because they're cold-blooded creatures. And so if a snake should come out of the ball, you, you chop its head off because it's a viper, right? It's poisonous. And baby vipers are as bad as grown vipers. They might have less venom, but it's just as poisonous. So you don't want to get bitten by a baby viper. So you chop off its head. Well, pretty soon another one's going to come out. And so when John calls them a brood of vipers, what he's saying is all of you, your lives are like balls of snakes. And they're filled with poison and venom. And no matter what you do, when you, when you think you're getting rid of you know, a snake, uh, there's always more behind it. And he's saying, you need, you need to change all this. You've you got you to gotta get cleaned out here. And so the other thing that we're starting to see in the earth right now is there is a huge deliverance revival rising. Now Mike was talking about deliverance monetarily. I'm talking about from evil spirits that are in people's bodies. And it's going on everywhere. I'm sure many of you have seen some of the videos of Catherine Crick, but we've got guys like Isaiah Salvador, and you know, there's been some of us running around doing deliverance for a long time. We're getting long in the tooth, so we need a new crop. But, um, but we've got to get rid of the snake balls. And John says, 
you know, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? It has become unpopular in our time to talk about the wrath of God, but there is still a judgment day awaiting us. It's down the road a bit, maybe, but, but on that day, every person will give an account for every single thing that they did in this lifetime, and they will be judged based on those deeds that they have done. And so John says, you need to produce fruit. You need to have a life that looks like you're genuinely repentant. And so he's saying, no more fake spirituality. No more fake Christianity. That's over. That's done. And don't think you're going to run and hide and say, well, I came out of the Vineyard Movement or the Calvary Chapel Movement or I was raised in an Assembly of God church or whatever. I was, I was baptized as a Catholic. Don't say I have Abraham as my father. This is on you to take responsibility for your spirituality and to live the life of a Christian to its fullest. That's what John is saying, and that is the third thing that's going on in this move of God. So it's a summons to change, to change your mind, and with it to change your life, and along the way, change your heart, which means you understand God differently, and you also understand yourself differently. Now, there's so many things I could say about that, but I'm actually pretty close to out of time, so I'm not going to elaborate at the moment. But I, I will say this, <clears throat> the encrustation of the heart happens slowly, like the coming of barnacles on a ship. And the thing with barnacles is you can have a ship that's newly cleaned, put it in the water, and a week later there'll be barnacles starting to form. But when you first run your hand along the hull, it'll still feel smooth. Give it another couple of weeks, it might start to feel a little bit rough like sandpaper, but nothing severe. But let it keep going, and pretty soon there'll be barnacles on top of the barnacles, and they'll be big and thick and visible. And this will actually slow the ship down. It'll cause noise, which submarines like if they're tracking them. Uh, there's a lot of things that are bad about having barnacles on the ship. The barnacles in our lives grow in much the same way. At first, you're unaware that they're even there. And basically, to, to extend that metaphor, it's time to get out one of those things that they use to clean ships and strip all the barnacles off your hull. And, and that, too, is part of tearing down mountains and raising up valleys. It's just very personal. And so a visitation is always preceded by preparation. And so it says of John that he was, he was intended, it was part of the prophecy over his life that the angel Gabriel gave to his father Zechariah that John would be a man who would prepare a people. They would become a people prepared. And since we, I'm saying that there's a John the Baptist generation coming, then what this means really is we're going to be turning one man to another, one woman to another, one woman to a man, one man to a woman, and we're going to be saying, have you prepared your heart, Mike? Are you ready for the Lord to come? Are you ready to be visited, Janice? Are you ready, Mike, for the Lord to come and visit you? Because you don't want to stand before him and go, ah, I thought I had a little more time. So substantive change means our actions match our words. And there's so many ways in which this could come into being. It has to do with our sexuality, has to do with our business ethics. You know, there's a lot of Christians I won't do business with anymore because I've been ripped off by them. That should never happen. Not ever, not even once. We should have the best business ethics on the planet. So we're talking now about congruence, living our lives in open so that what we are in secret matches who we are in public. I remember years ago, John Wimber talking to one of the uh, people in our church up in Yorba Linda, and there were some problems in this individual's life. And uh, John, I'm, I'm deliberately obscuring because there'd be a number of people in this room who know the individual I'm referring to. Uh, but anyway, uh, John said to this individual, your problem isn't that you aren't saved. Your problem is that you don't live like it. Well, there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of barnacles growing on the bottom of ships right now, and we've got to get these ships cleaned up. And so what you did 10 years ago, two years ago, six months ago, last week, doesn't matter. What are you walking in now? Faith comes by active hearing, and a people who are prepared have cleaned these things up. When John says that every tree that does not bear fruit will be cut down, some people think of this as like a warning of hellfire. It might be right, but the way I like to think about it is really 
All of us have trees that are growing up in our lives. They came from seeds that were planted, or nuts, years before. These are long-term issues, and if these trees are not bearing good fruit, it's time to chop them down. Get rid of those trees. And if it means a substantive, even painful, realignment of your life, then that's what it means. Just do what you got to do because he's worth it, because the kingdom is worth it, because Jesus is our magnificent obsession, and we, we want to be ready for him, Judy. That's what we're waiting for. And, and if, if we are embarrassed at his appearing, if we are somehow not yet ready for that, then all is lost. And so the people ask him for specifics. They ask him, what should we do? I stopped reading at this point. But he says, look, if you have two tunics or jackets, give one away to somebody who doesn't have one. And if you have more excess food, give away to others. So he's talking about generosity, and he's talking about sharing abundance. And what he's really after is the hard issues of greed and lack of love for your neighbor. And then the next group um, are the tax collectors. And he says to them, you need to be honest. Stop stealing and stop selling out your countrymen. Because, in fact, the tax collectors were all Jewish, and the Romans hired them. They spoke the language. They knew the culture. And they knew where people would hide money, and they would go suss it out. And so what were the hard issues for the tax collectors? Well, they were collecting more than they were supposed to. So greed, avarice, pride, the abuse of others. And then to the soldiers who came, now these would be Romans themselves who were being impacted. So this is spilling out beyond Jewish society. He said, don't extort. Don't abuse your office. So the hard issue there are things like lying and mishandling of funds. And so the third thing we can see about the coming move of God is that our own lives will be on examination by us, but maybe by our brothers and sisters. We might, we might actually look at each other and say, do you see anything in me that needs addressing? And instead of taking offense when they say something, we say, thank you. Thank you for helping me to walk more fully with Jesus. Because changed hearts are necessary in order to have a changed life. And finally, there is this preparation and fulfillment aspect. This was John's ministry. All the people were in expectation. Now, expectation, I learned this in the Australian revival when I was out there. Expectation is uh, inflammable. And um, in those years, I developed a little tagline, expectation is the combustible fuel of faith. When people have expectation, that's when things really go off. And so the question we have to ask ourselves, are we in expectation like they were in expectation? Because they're looking at John, they're going, man, this guy checks a lot of boxes. Maybe this is the Christ. And he corrects that, but they're still in expectation because they know if he's the Elijah who is to come, then Jesus has to be right behind it. The Messiah has to be right behind it. And I started out by telling you about a lot of signs that are in the earth right now, things that if you're paying attention and you read them, like I said, this may very well be the leading edge of the big one. We're at that time in the prophetic time clock. And so can you let expectation arise, or are you still kind of jaded and burned out from all the other false starts that we've had? <laughs> so John's ministry was a preparation ministry. It humbled everybody because baptism was actually what a proselyte to Judaism went through. And he's saying, you need to be reconverted, Jews. That's why you can't let the fact that you're descended from Abraham be your calling card. You need to have your own encounter of all this. And what he further told them was that what Jesus, the Messiah, will bring is not only more powerful, but it is fundamentally of a different order. And he said his winnowing fork is in his hand. A winnowing fork is used to save what is useful and to separate out what is useless. And he says that the fire that will consume the chaff is, interesting word, asbestos. It's unquenchable. Well, it's going to be in an unquenchable fire, so... There, there's another unquenchable fire yet to come. It's called the flames of hell. But for the now, there is this continual burning in which we are to live where we remain pure having become purified. Or as John Calvin said it a little more elegantly in Latin, ecclesia reformata, semper reformanda. The church having been reformed must continue to be reformed. 
We need to live in that place of fire so that the Lord continues to keep a people who are prepared. Prior moves of God have emphasized holiness or power. Depends on whose revival you were in. In the 20s, they had the Keswick movement. It was about holiness and the higher life. In our time, we had Lonnie and we had power. Um, but in this move, these are going to merge and converge. And so you'll have a holy people moving in power. That's going to happen. Well, as that occurs, church culture is going to change along with the outside culture being impacted. I can think of things that I saw in the Australian outpouring years ago. Um, I'll just say there was a divisive man, a very divisive man who had alienated everybody in his church. I'm not really sure why the pastors actually hadn't asked him to leave, but anyway, he was a very divisive man. And when he was hit by this fire and he realized how he had been, he went around to every single person in the church and asked for forgiveness for being the way he had been. And there was a great breach in the church that was healed as a result of that. I'm thinking of another man who had had a lifelong um, addiction to pornography. He was completely set free. We hear these stories, so that one maybe doesn't quite have the wow factor. It should, but, but we do occasionally hear those stories. And I'm thinking of another man who was in one of these meetings, and he was so impacted by what God had done that he literally left the mafia. He was in the mafia. Now, that could cost you your life to leave La Cosa Nostra, but he did, and he survived. So what in the world is God doing with all these things that are on the table that we've been talking about? Well, he is birthing a new way to understand faith that's anchored in reality and theology. And there is a, there's a practical demonstration, and with that, the, our faith is becoming more evidential. Secondly, he's causing a movement to spring up in unlikely places that may be far from the established centers of power. And it's interesting to me on that point, by the way, I didn't say this when we were earlier in the message, but um, there were a number of fairly visible people who went to Asbury when it was going on. And when they showed up, the leaders said, uh, thanks, you can sit in the crowd if you want, but you're not taking the stage and you're not going to tell us anything about revival. We don't want yet input. Thank you very much. And it was because they were trying to avoid some of the excesses and maybe misdeeds that they'd seen in some of those people. Um, the third thing he's calling is people to become practical about how they live their faith. In these three vignettes we have about people saying, what should we do? How do we live? He's saying, don't just talk cheap talk. He's saying, put it in practice in your life and make your faith real. And so the soldiers are told, you know, don't extort money. And the tax collectors don't collect more than you should. And, and if you've got two Cokes, give one away and so forth. All right. And then finally, he's uniting power and purity in a way that maybe we haven't seen in our lifetimes. Now, if you've lived long enough, maybe you saw it somewhere sometime along the way. But um, this is an upgrade. And so with that, I think we should all be in great expectation about all that the Lord intends to do, wants to do, and know that we are called to be part of it, and we will be part of that nameless, faceless generation that was prophesied when the prophets first showed up 35 years ago. So that's it. That's what's going on in the world. Now, um, I would be remiss after giving a message like this if I didn't give you an opportunity to respond to the Lord personally. So as I was speaking, there could be any number of responses. And they always say, give only one altar call so people don't get confused, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to actually give you a couple of things you could respond to. One would be you realize, you know, I got a lot of barnacles on my ship, and I need to repent of things in my life. I've been going through the motions as a Christian, but I'm actually not really living a Christian life. And in so many words, I mean, good for me, I showed up at church this morning, but, but I'm not actually doing too well as a Christian. And so this could become your opportunity to rededicate your life to the Lord. By the way, right beside that, there may be a few here. I wouldn't expect there to be many, but there may be some who have never actually accepted Jesus and have never come into the Christian life. 
I mean, these soldiers who were asking, what do we do? They were coming into that life at that time. They had never done that, but they were living around it. So you may have been living around Christians or somehow you're aware of Christianity. It may have been a lifelong thing or it may be a more recent thing. You've developed some consciousness of it, but you need to get saved. You need to be born again. I want to give you a chance to come up. So we'll get the, the newly born again. Maybe you'll come here and all the people that are getting barnacles off their hulls over here. Uh, but the, the third group, you may be doing just fine in your walk with the Lord, but you want to you wanna raise your hand and say, I want to commit to be one of those John the Baptist people and be part of that John generation. And I'm not sure how we're going to fit you in, but we'll put you over there and we'll just do the best we can. I'm going to need the entire ministry team to help pray. All right, so we got three groups. You need to be born again, you need to repent, <laughs> and you want to commit yourself to the purposes of God. All right, let's go. Let's get her done. 